Good morning and welcome to worship this very cold morning. It's Sunday, February 14th, 2021. And I'll just throw in there and wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day as well. Um, today is Transfiguration as we move forward into Lent. Ash Wednesday, um, our services, as I have noted before, will all be virtual. So the Ash Wednesday service will um, be available um, by Wednesday afternoon. Um, I would invite you at that time to, um, to find a little bowl of water or maybe a little bowl of, um, if you have a house plant or something, to have it nearby. And um, we'll just be able to feel um, God's presence in that we'll have, uh, be able to use the sign of the cross either with water or if you just would like to make the sign of the cross in, the, in, the, in some dirt will also work. So um, we'll have that available. Um, be ready for that on uh, Wednesday. So let us begin our worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin and our sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. For self-centered living and for failing to walk with humility and gentleness, Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. For longing to have what is not ours, and for hearts that are not at rest with ourselves, Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. For misuse of human relationships and for unwillingness to see the images of God in others, Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. For jealousies that divide families and nations and for rivalries that create strife and warfare, Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. For reluctance in sharing the gifts of God and for carelessness with the fruits of creation, Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. For hurtful words that condemn and for angry deeds that harm, Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. For idleness and witnessing to Jesus Christ and for squandering the gifts of love and grace, Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintops into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from 2 Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Giggle. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. 
Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you, before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. The word of the Lord. A reading from Psalm 50. The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken, calling the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence, with a consuming flame before and round about a raging storm. God calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of the people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the rightness of God's cause, for it is God who is judge. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. We fall down to lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, and we cry, holy, 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 we cry, holy, 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 we cry, holy, 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 is the Lamb. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Jesus said, Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The word of the Lord. So since we live in pretty much in the flattest part of the Midwest, 
It might be hard for us to imagine what Peter, James, and John experienced in today's gospel. There they are as Moses and Elijah and Jesus are on the mountain enveloped in a cloud. Most of us have been out and seen the mountains. I remember my first experience. I was a young adult and I was totally awestruck at the size and majesty of those huge spectacles of rock. They were truly beautiful. And as you travel further and further up and you look down below, it is a breathtaking view. One you may also notice is the difference in weather as you move up the mountain. Like a cloudy day in Chicago, the clouds can envelop the tallest of buildings so much that you can only see the bottom of the building. And we stand there and wonder, how does all of this happen? Today, as we hear about transfiguration, an interesting word that if we walk down the street, many people would have no idea about what we were talking about. So Jesus and these three disciples walk up a mountain and hear the voice of God while enveloped in a cloud. The majesty and harrowing heights of the mountain and sublime and sometimes fearsome powers of clouds and storms are places of divine encounters in the Bible. What a place to meet Jesus, the beloved, in all his glory. But as we know, the majesty of the mountain will be overtaken by the dark shadow of the cross. As Jesus comes down from that mountain, he knows this journey will end. Today is Valentine's Day, a day symbolic of love. Love for our families, our friends, and maybe those we aren't so close to. Because the transfiguration is so bizarre and so unusual, it can be easy to assume that we're supposed to approach it with a sober reverence and awe. But this isn't how God views it. For God, the transfiguration represents an opportunity to declare love for the one called Son. So Moses, Elijah, and even God are not the only signs for the alert that God's reign is coming. Peter, contrary to popular portrayal, makes the connection that is too obscure for us to make. According to some Jewish expectation, as stated in the book of Zechariah, the prophet, God would usher in the new age, the day of the Lord during the Feast of Booths. This God-commanded festival kept by Jews for centuries was considered a possible time for God taking control of God's creation. So Peter's question about building booths is neither laughable nor mistaken. Peter is clear that the end times are coming and that this feast was upon them. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus need not construct their own booths for the celebration. In Mark's gospel, a story so full of concealment and secrecy, the transfiguration says that this Jesus has plans to be conspicuous. What he will disclose is not necessarily the secrets of the universe or the meaning of life, rather it's himself. He may be hard to see clearly in all this intricate detail with the radiant glare and the transfigured body and all, but sometimes at least the sights and sounds of the transfiguration also suggest that Peter, James, and John find themselves on holy ground in privileged company. After all, Jesus appears alongside Moses and Elijah, the two greatest prophets in Jewish memories. Many things made those two ancient prophets great. For one thing, in the Bible, each shares a moment of striking intimacy with God. Through Moses' face-to-face -face chats with God and his glimpse of God's backside, and Elijah's encounter with God in a strange sound of sheer silence, when one is so close to God, everything changes. Impossibilities dissolve. Their life, your life, one becomes transformed in the presence of Jesus. So what does this mean for us today? How do we experience a transfiguration moment? And more importantly, how do we share it with others? 
Barbara Brown Taylor actually advises against talking about the transfiguration. She reminds us that neither Jesus nor the three that there talked about it. Jesus told them to tell no one until after the resurrection. So have you ever tried to keep a secret? Yeah, well, we know how that all goes. It's not easy. And a secret like this makes it even harder. What she suggests is not an attempt to give some reasonable explanation of what happened on the mountain. Strange things happen on mountains in scriptures. And when the Bible says someone is going to the mountain, an epiphany is about to happen. We all need those mountaintop experiences. These are sacred moments with God. When God's presence is near to us, Peter, James, and John were assured that in leaving everything to follow Jesus, they were on the right track. Sure, there was doubt at times. The religious authorities, the cross, the cross was the empire's last resort to keep order and maintain power. I came across this story, and there was a pastor and a church historian who has been leading seminars in Russia and the Middle East for years. In orientations for his trip, he often reads the story of the transfiguration, and he recreates an experience he has as a graduate student while doing research. He came across a manuscript written by a monk in the sixth century who suggested that there was a miracle in the transfig transfiguration story that may have been ignored. The disciples had their eyes opened and they saw a new reality. It was revealed to them that the way to Jesus was God's way in the world. The one that they had been following had the power to transform them into agents of God's love and justice to heal a broken world. They were overcome by fear. They were now responsible to share that reality that God in Christ was sharing with them. It was up to them. It is up to us. God is in charge of what we are called to do. We never know what God is up to on our lives, and we are afraid at times. God gives us mountaintop experiences and transforms us. These experiences change the way we see the world around us. These experiences transform us and give us the confidence in the steadfast love of Jesus Christ, and they sustain us through the trials and the tribulations. Though those cloudy day, through those cloudy days and those brilliantly sunny days on the mountaintop, we remember why we are here and why we do what we do. And somehow with that to carry us, we are able to join Jesus in going back down the mountain and joining God's beloved people in times and places where they also find themselves yearning for the kind of understanding and hope which too often we only receive when we have been on the mountaintop. The transfiguration stands between time, the time after Pentecost, when we're learning to be church and Lent, beginning with Ash Wednesday, when we are thrust back into the hard truth that we are dust, until dust we shall return. The power of the transfiguration is that it plants our hearts and minds, the brilliance of eternity on the mountain with the greatest prophets, emboldening us for the journey together as the body of Christ. The transfiguration prepares us to come to terms with our humility, our soil nature, or utter dependence on God. At the transfiguration, then Jesus stands in impressive company sharing the moment with two others who know what it is to share close communion with God and to frustrate that pesky and seemingly unyielding boundary between life and death. The bright light of the transfiguration affirms life, a light that shines ahead into Lent to keep that season in perspective, never without hope and never without confidence. This light speaks a promise that God is here and that God is knowable. Our God seeks relationships because God is life, a life transformed in the love of a Savior who will take that love to his death on the cross. Amen. 
Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all in need. For the gospel proclaimed in word and deed, for communities of faith far and near, and for all who show the face of Christ throughout the world, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For creation, sun, moon, and stars, life forming in the dark earth and ocean deep, 
mountains, clouds, and storms, and creatures seen and unseen, and for the Holy Spirit's guidance in our stewardship of God's creation. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those responsible for safety and protection, for emergency responders and security guards, attorneys and advocates, civil servants and leaders of government, that they witness to mercy and justice throughout the world. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all who suffer this day, that Christ our healer transform sickness into health, loneliness into companionship, bereavement into consolation, and suffering into peace. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For companions on life's journey in this worshiping community, for loved ones who cannot be with us this day, and for guidance during struggles we face, that God's glory is revealed around and among us, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their earthly pilgrimage, that their lives of service and prayer inspire us in our living, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the ones who dwell among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive God's blessing. God, the creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.